the drama of Peloton. Let's take a deep dive into the home trainer company and how its supply chain complexities nearly bankrupted the company. In 2019, Peloton's revenue was pushing $700 million. This number doubled in 2020, reaching $1.82 billion and doubled again to reach $4 billion in 2021. With people stranded at home and gyms closing and exercise equipment manufactured focused on motivating people to do sports at home through exhilarating classes seemed destined to encounter meteoric success in an economy stricken by a pandemic. Even Joe Biden fought with his security staff to bring his Peloton bike to the White House. As revenues kept growing, one would assume that the overall company valuation would follow the same path. Well, not exactly. At its highest in December of 2020, Peloton's stock price reached $162, but has since been declining and now sits at less than $30, a whole 80% drop. Not only that, but Peloton has also recently announced it was firing 2,800 employees and considered a potential sale to corporations such as Nike, Amazon or Apple. It's quite a surprising turn for a company that was once the top of the digital fitness food chain. So let's look at three things. First, the series of events that put Peloton in quite a delicate position. Second, how the supply chain played such a significant role in the problems they faced. And third, in parallel to all of this, we'll explore the lessons that are learned from this problem. So, what was the problem exactly? When the pandemic hit and the lockdown spread around the world, people had no choice but to train at home. As a result, at the end of 2020, 1.7 million households were equipped with Peloton products. The following year, this number grew by 1 million. However, the exercise equipment manufactured quickly found itself challenged by demand simply outstripping the supply. Even die-hard fans of the brand grew impatient and resentful as delivery delays simply got out of hand. Peloton suffered the same consequences as many other companies importing goods manufactured in Asia due to this horrendous shipping crisis. Faced with what appeared to be a broken supply chain, the CEO stated that the company would now invest a staggering $100 million in order to speed up the delivery alone. Now, this investment would allow the use of air cargo instead of just ocean freight to move product from its Asian manufacturer to the U.S. Obviously, paying a surplus for air cargo does not represent an investment in the supply chain, but rather a way to ease customer dissatisfactions, all while burning cash. This move meant that the cost of delivery for each product will be multiplied by 10. Air cargo is certainly not a long-term solution for transporting bikes and treadmills, but the company's usage indicated just how big the problem really was. Shortly after, Pelton announced that it was acquiring Precor, a major provider of working machines, for $420 million in an attempt to scale up their operations. This was meant to give them access to 625,000 square feet of manufacturing space in the U.S. Now, there were signs, however, that Peloton's success wouldn't last forever. When the first news of a viable COVID vaccine came out, the stock value fell by a whole 25 percent, as investors feared that gyms would eventually reopen and the attractions for digital fitness would slowly fade away. During a period of frantic demand, expediting and in-housing efforts may have made sense. But that demand wasn't as strong or stable as one would hope for. Near the end of 2021, the company's CFO declared that it is clear that we underestimated the reopening impact on our company and the overall industry. But hold on, let's pause right there because there is one key word in this quote underestimated. So it simply means that the management was planning operations against a version of the future that they believed would come to pass and may have been partly ignoring all the adversal alternatives that seemed to them as being less likely to happen. Now we'll come back to this point in a second. So the vertical integration and control over manufacturing that Peloton worked so hard in achieving would have been an outstanding move to keep up with the growing demand for their products. However, going too far and not being able to detect the downwards trends in demand created a dramatic case of the bulb effect. But what is the bulb effect exactly, I hear you ask? Well, the bulb effect is when the fluctuations of the system exceed the magnitude of the fluctuations that are fed into the system. Now, I know this is a lot of words, so let's unpack. Fluctuations in the consumer demand is a typical example. 
So why does it exactly get amplified upstream? Well, there are multiple steps included in the journey of a physical product from its sourcing to it arriving in the consumer hands. A typical supply chain setup consists of manufacturers, suppliers, wholesalers, and retailers. As nobody wants to be out of stock, it is common to slightly overestimate the actual demand by placing larger orders to account for uncertainty. All of this becomes amplified even more on the trend of the fast growth that the company and its suppliers are trying to anticipate. This is, in essence, what happened to Peloton, and the results were devastating. Warehouse workers said that Peloton warehouses were so full they resembled jigsaw puzzles, with employees trying to figure out just where to stuff another bike. The bullop effect is known to cause great inefficiencies and costs through poor customer satisfaction, lost revenues, and of course, excess inventory. While a lot of supply chain experts would agree that the bullop effect is inevitable, we would argue that a better class of tools and practices might help mitigate the bullop effect. Such practices may include enhancing the visibility and collaboration across stakeholders in the supply chain or efforts to reduce lead time delays and order sizes on top of a more stable form of pricing. So let's take the angle of the traditional approach to operations planning, starting with the demand forecasting, an approach that is used among the vast majority of companies the classic time series forecast. So without getting too technical, time series forecasts can come in different flavors with their own pros and cons. But what all models have in common is a numerical stability problem dependent on the fact that with a point forecast, we only look at one number, a future that is most likely to happen. So the potential range of outcomes is mostly ignored in this perspective. In the realm of a more adequate perspective based on probabilistic forecast, most of those problems entirely disappear because in a probabilistic perspective, we have all possible futures in front of us at all times, and instead of picking a single future to plan operations against, we'll look at all possibilities simultaneously and re-evaluating their probabilities and economic consequences as new information comes to the market. So due to this tremendous backlog of inventory, Inventory, Peloton first decided to delay the constructions of what would have been their first factory, and then they took the decisions to cancel the project altogether, which resulted in $60 million in reconstructing capital expenditures. Additionally, the fitness brand is reducing in-house warehousing and delivery operations and shifting towards third-party fulfillment vendors. However, Peloton might have waited for too long as making such changes while the demand is still dropping is extremely dangerous as far as the company is concerned. This might very well be the consequence of the inadequate perspective to operations planning using time series forecasts. So, when is the right time for a company to internalize its operations and what should be considered before doing so? As we previously mentioned with probabilistic forecasts, in a situation of high growth and high uncertainty, a company should look at all the possible scenarios, and if evaluation of probabilities changes quickly, meaning that the irreducible uncertainty is high, then a management should not commit itself to courses of action where it is hard to undo things. Instead, it should look for ways to cultivate more options for the business because in high uncertainty situations, it is never clear which one of those options will be needed and those options should be easy to undo, change, or switch between. In such situations, instead of focusing on maximizing sales and margins, a management should be focusing itself on the mere survival of the company and to not let the irreducible uncertainty simply kill it. So does this mean that being equipped with probabilistic forecasts and changing the way Peloton makes long-term decisions would have saved them from all this trouble? Maybe. Or maybe they would have endured other hardships for different reasons. However, if there's one thing that we know for sure is that the supply chain management can play a huge role in the success or failure of a company. Supply chain is not the poor parent anymore and it's time we recognize it as such.